to not just why empowering young people is so important when it comes to water and climate issues, but also how to do it. Now, we're very fortunate this morning to have an international, multi-generational, multilingual panel uh, composed of water and climate professionals and advocates who are going to help us to get to the bottom of this question. Uh, next slide, please. So before I introduce our panelists, uh, a quick word on why we're all here today. Uh, this session is a collaboration between the Valley Water Initiative, WaterAid, and as you can see on your screen, quite a large number of partner organizations, uh, all of whom are passionate about doing more to involve young people in the search for solutions to the water and climate challenges that we all face. Now, speaking on behalf of the Valley and Water Initiative, but I think also for WaterAid and for our other co-conveners as well, we believe that young people hold the key to a more climate resilient future. As a sector, we know, of course, that water is the common thread that connects all of our climate mitigation and adaptation efforts. But we must also recognize that young people are central to the success and the sustainability of those efforts. So our starting point today is that by empowering youth, we can achieve better, more sustainable outcomes, not only for young people as a demographic, but for the water and climate sector as a whole. Now, briefly then, uh, for those who are not familiar with the Valley and Water Initiative or VWI, we're a Dutch government programme. We work with stakeholders across different contexts and sectors to demonstrate the practical application of the Valley and Water Principles. Uh, these were set out in 2018 by the UN World Bank High Level Panel on Water, and they're intended to help us better use, manage and value water. Uh, so we work across a range of different issue areas in the water sector, not just youth engagement, um, if you're interested to know more about the programme, you can find more information about us online. Uh, today, we're going to keep things focused on our youth work. Uh, next slide, please. So the challenge. Over the past few months, uh, VWI has been working with the Water Youth Network to carry out a scoping study into the state of youth engagement in the water sector as a whole. And we essentially wanted to understand what works, what doesn't work and what's needed when it comes to helping improve outcomes in this space. And we've tried to approach the issue systemically. So we, want to, we don't want to set up a new project or initiative just for its own sake. Um, we would much prefer to support and facilitate where possible the good work that we all know is already going on in this space. Now, what our research has shown is that there's some excellent youth engagement and empowerment work, various platforms, initiatives, projects that are already happening. Um, that won't be a surprise to most of you in the audience today. I'm sure many of you are already working uh, on these issues. But what our study found is that despite the good work that's happening, young people are still frequently underrepresented and disempowered in water governance and decision making. Now, as you can see on the screen, there are several different elements to this problem. Uh, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it's just a few of the sort of key obstacles that, that we identified. Um, hierarchical decision making is one. This is where young people are excluded solely on the basis of their age. Tokenism and box ticking is something that we encountered a lot as well, uh, where young people are um, involved in a participatory sense, but participation is seen as an end in itself. Uh, and young people don't have an opportunity to meaningfully influence decisions or outcomes. Uh, we've also encountered a lot of technocratic barriers uh, where young people are excluded from contributing to water and climate policies or other solutions purely because they lack specific technical training or education. Um, language barriers is something else that we've encountered a lot in this area at the international level. We did find a lot of excellent work on capacity development in particular uh, that's happening in the sector, um, but we know that more is needed if we want to make a real difference. And finally, we found quite a lot of fragmentation among the engagement and empowerment initiatives that already exist that we think would benefit from greater cooperation. Now, as I mentioned, this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, it's just a summary of some of the issues that we've identified in this research. The key point to take away here is that every stakeholder group, whether that's policymakers, NGOs, donors, um, private sector or research institutes, um, has a role to play in helping to address these challenges. Now, to kickstart our discussion on uh, how we're going to start doing that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, he's present in person at the Water Pavilion in Glasgow. Henko Vink is the Netherlands Special Envoy for International Water Affairs. He was closely involved in the high-level panel for water. 
which first outlined the Valley and Water Principles and which gave rise to the Valley and Water Initiative. Uh, Henk is going to share his perspective on what policymakers and the public sector can do to address this youth engagement question. Uh, so Henk, the floor is yours. Ah, yeah. Hey, Joe. Good to see. I have to look there, of course. It's crazy because I want to look at Joe. It's good to uh, uh, see and hear you, uh, Joe, and it's also good to uh, have a, a small crowd here at the first ever water pavilion at the COP, putting water at the heart of climate action, uh, and on Youth Day at the COP, putting youth at the heart of uh, the work we have to do. And um, uh, Joe asked me to talk a little bit of the COP uh, on what we did with the high-level panel on water, uh, because that panel originated from, you could say, uh, a group of water friends. Uh, I was am among that small group where we said, World Bank, the Netherlands, uh, uh, OECD, w, uh, w, uh, the WEF, uh, CW and some others, water needs to be higher on the political agenda, on the societal agenda, across all sectors and silos we see. But to make that happen, we also need the engagement of leadership. Uh, so the panel is not the answer to all your questions, but it is part of many of the challenges we face is that water is so in the basement of our policy discussions, in the basement of political negotiations, in the basement of investment prioritization, in the basement, etc. So lifting water to that political level is only one aspect. And we brought together a group of presidents and prime ministers, secretary general of the UN and the president of the World Bank and the private sector and youth and NGOs and academia at the World Economic Forum. Uh, not so hybrid at that time. This was uh, 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 20, uh, uh, 2016, January, where we said we have to do this. We have to be able to raise water to a higher level with an outcome really to help drive sustainable development and climate action, because we know sustainable development is undercut if we don't understand water's complexity, if we don't value water across all aspects of society, if we don't start to manage it inclusively, including all, but it's not happening. Eh? So we need that uh, political power and empowerment. Uh, that group, which was a large group at WEF, uh, then got together uh, under the leadership of then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and then President of the World Bank Jim Kim on Earth Day in New York in the offices of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and said, OK, we have presidents and prime ministers, including my own. We have Sherpas as a group. That is only the beginning. Now we have to rally the world. And I think what we try to do, and of course, we have to be very modest in this, because uh, succeeding in that is hard, but what we try to do is uh, drive a conversation across the world and across stakeholders and really trying to give meaning to what this means if you say include in inclusion. Eh? Uh, in inclusion for me means that you, you always have a door open, eh? that no one's ever too late, even if the process is you know, on, on, uh, on 80%. Uh, that uh, you always ask a question before you start to pose an answer, that uh, the capacity within society is, you know, what, because of its overwhelming uh, capacity, um, should have a voice always. But it's very tough. And in political decision making, I think this is what Joe wants me to talk about too, is the door is often closed. Yeah, policy makers or in private sector or financial sector, they say, okay, let's figure this out first and then ask others what they think. And that is the opposite of inclusion, that is exclusion. Because you should not figure this out by yourself, you can only figure this out together and then start to see if it works. Uh, and I think with the high level panel on water, that was of course always the balance. Where do we start? Well, you have to start out there to end up in the right level inside. But how does policy making and decision making and financial validation start? They start inside and then see how it works. This is why we are here at the COP, 
uh, and are not in, a, in an amazing world where everybody has water uh, and there's no climate problems, eh? because everybody works in their silos, in their sectors, um, and one aspect of that is youth. Uh, I'm a water envoy, um, which is a, um, I d um, well, nobody actually knows what it is, but that's okay, it's an ambassador for water. Uh, so I uh, rally the world around water, uh, uh, focusing on water awareness, but also helping to build capacity, and I remember my, f my first World Water Forum in Korea, South Korea, in 2015, the youth had the honor to take notes. I was appalled. So that is not what inclusion means, Joe, right? Um, and this, is, this is not how it can work. And then in Brazil, in Brasilia, um, youth was part of the conversation. And now towards Senegal, we hope that youth helps set the agenda. And this is what, uh, and I remember my dear friends, uh, Kees van der Guchte uh, from Deltares, who passed away, was very sick uh, uh, um, only a month ago. Uh, he was, a, a, you know, we were together in Madrid. And he, he and I, in Brazil, signed with the Water Youth Net this deal to not let that happen again. Eh? Uh, uh. But it is hard, and it is not because of youth, it is because of silos. It's not that old white male people like me hate youth, no, or that they can't stand that conversation, but it is because we are organized in a very fragmented, siloed way. Public and private, a big gap. Young and old, a big gap. Indigenous and not, a big gap. Uh, any color around the world, a big gap. Any background, any region, a big gap. And the only way we will get to sustainable development and climate action is forget about the gaps. We're in it together. Big or small, rich or poor, north or south, young or old. But the empowerment of young and youth is then of critical importance. But that should also not lead to exclusion. Yeah, uh, my parents are long gone, but my father turned 97 before he died. So he's a, he was an old man, but he still wanted to be part, yeah, together with the, the youngest. So when we focus on youth, uh, we have this focus on everyone. And I think learning what inclusion means, learning that you always have to ensure that every voice has a place and because of a stake and an interest is of critical importance. Last, Joe, when I worked for the Obama administration, um, we had um, a Hurricane Sandy that devastated the New York region. Um, I worked for the federal government, so uh, hey, you're, you're there and then you know a lot of distrust in society. And we said, we have to include everybody. And we started to work with the ones that disagreed most. And sometimes that really helps. Eh? That you, that you organize, and I think this is to the point what you have to organize, where the responsibility lies with the institutions, the ones that do have the power and the money to organize, is that you step down. Eh? It's not that you say, hey, I didn't hear you because you didn't talk. No, the responsibility lies with the institutional capacity to say, open the door, step down and listen, and not say this is what should happen. And I think that is the, the biggest barrier, perhaps, Joe, is that that doesn't happen. Eh? We didn't hear you. No, you have to open your ears. We didn't hear you. No, you did not organize a process where everybody was here. We didn't hear you. No, because you didn't invite us. And I think this is the problem. Eh? The silos become an excuse for not listening. And that should never be the excuse. Eh? We should step down. Uh, and that is not to say that bottom-up is the only way. Because you need a rule. You need guidance, and we see at the COP, without rules and guidance, forget about climate action. Uh, but you also have to really be on the ground and understand challenges, problems, and needs from everybody to be able to progress in the right direction. I could go on, Joe, but that's not the idea uh, no, of this morning. Oh, no, yeah. no, we're on a very tight schedule, but thank you so much, Hank. Um, Kato, could we just reinstate the, the PowerPoint, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Hank, for sharing those reflections. I, I think there's a very important message there. I mean, it's it's very clear to me, at least, that if we want to be inclusive, we have to be proactive about it. 
we, we don't have the luxury of just assuming that inclusion, youth inclusion uh, happens by default. We need to actually take action. Uh, so thank you for setting the tone there. Um, I'd like now to introduce our next speaker. And it, and it also does oh. not happen. And, 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 uh, and I think that's for all the speakers, because some are old and others are young. Uh, I, I think there is a responsibility within the world of institutions because they have the capacity to skip this. Uh, this is about everybody. And the burden should not be with the youth uh, uh, alone. It should be with all of us. And the less you're hurt, yeah, yeah, the harder you scream, which is the only thing you then can do. But that is the, the you know, the, the the, the 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 least inspiring part of it is the the most inspiring is that if we find ways forward where that institutional world breaks down its silos and you have to help us with that yeah? without your help and I'm not saying you know uh, it won't happen but without that call to action and cry of pain across society it won't happen and this is what this is why we're here yeah? again at the COP struggling to get 1.5 degree, struggling to get water action across everything we have to do, mitigation and adaptation. So that, that cry is of critical importance. Yeah, absolutely. No, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Hank, thank you. Um, so I'd like now to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Sana Holstecher is Programme Coordinator at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre. Uh, she has direct experience of working with young people on climate issues in a civil society context. Uh, so Sana, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction and uh, thank you for your inspiring words, um, Hank Kovink. It is a great pleasure to be here on this panel today. Um, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement is made up of 12 million volunteers in 192 national societies. And about half of our volunteers are young people. So our network presents a huge opportunity for youth-led impact on the ground. On Earth Day uh, in 2021, the IFRC and the Climate Center launched Direct Cross and Red Crescent strategy on youth-led climate action. Youth play a key role in ensuring that people now and future generations can adapt to changing risks. The focus of our strategy is threefold. It's focusing on increasing awareness, engaging in practical action, and enabling meaningful advocacy. This strategy has not only been created for the youth, but also by youth. A series of consultations, surveys, virtual engagements were held and importantly to note in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. And it allowed more than 1,200 youth from all over the world to participate. This strategy can be used uh, by national societies and their young leaders to shape their climate action, uh, actions. And uh, it provides them concrete tools that are ready to use. And one of them is called Why Adapt. My next slide, please. Why Adapt stands for Youth Adapt. It's a curriculum of young people for young people consisting of games and playful activities. It helps them to both understand climate change, but also to take practical action and adapt to the changing climate in their community. The pictures here are from all across the world, uh, Mexico, Philippines, uh, Samoa, um, et cetera. Why ADAPT has seven sessions. Uh, in one of them, they learn the difference between weather and climate. In another, they see that differentiated impacts um, are happening in their community. I recently joined the training in Mexico uh, remotely, and it's increasingly, I, it's, no, sorry, it's incredible to see just with a simple um, exercise that people start to see how disasters impact different people in their community differently. Um, women versus men, people with and without disabilities, young versus old. There's also a session focused at system thinking, where the youth through a card game competes to identify how people, places, and things fit into the systems of their community. With these new insights from the curriculum, um, they look at their own communities through a new lens, and they take these insights on board during the action phase of the curriculum, which I believe makes Why Adapt unique. It is focused on taking action. They design a plan to adapt their community 
to a specific hazard of their choice. In the action phase, we try and make sure to get decision makers uh, already involved. And to them, we really emphasize the need to provide positive and constructive feedback. The goal is that the youth get to experience that how small their action might be, they can make a difference in their community. And to give a few examples of what the youth have done so far, um, in Haiti, a group of youth decided that they would start clearing the drains uh, around their neighborhood um, because the drains were um, reduced, were increasing flooding risk. And they decided to involve the market merchants who were partly responsible for the rubbish in the drains. They've also had youth use art and music to raise community awareness. I'm always inspired to see that happen. And finally, in the Philippines, we had a group of youth advocate for their, um, with their local official that an, the, a water tank should be installed in their community so that there would be a common source of water during uh, times of drought. I believe those examples that I'm giving you today now show how by giving youth a space in which they get encouraged to take action, they will do so. And their intervention does not need to be perfect because they will learn along the way. Now for my recommendations directed at our sector. Next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of talk about capacity building. Um, my recommendation would be to my fellow peers is make sure your efforts are innovative and interactive. Both elements can really ensure for great stimulating learning experience. And when you do capacity building, make use of the spaces and entry points that your organizations already have. Don't invite you to spaces that you're creating, but meet them where they are. The Red Cross, for example, is often asked to give first aid lessons in schools, which gives us a good relationship with a lot of different schools. This is our entry point often. And in the UK, a partnership with the Scouts provided the space to pilot Quietapt. Secondly, um, ensure youth engagement in planning and policy, sorry, planning and decision-making processes is happening. It's a recommendation given by many, uh, but there's still so much to gain in our sector. We advocate a lot in policy spaces where we can do better in ensuring that youth voices are heard there. And please don't forget the languages. Finally, create a space for youth-led action. Don't just design actions in which youth are engaged, but give them the space to design and lead their own. And when doing so, encourage and support them to approach government officials, school principals, cultural leaders, et cetera, because both these stakeholders and our own organizations should make resources available uh, to them to take action. Thank you, over to you, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Sana. Um, and thanks for making these recommendations so practical. Um, it's great to be able to get into the nitty gritty because we want this session to be one that really helps our, our participants, our audience to understand the concrete practical actions um, that they can implement in their own organizations to make a difference on this topic. So. Uh, thank you for, for, for your emphasis on that. So uh, Henk has talked about policymakers in the public sector. Uh, Sana has talked about civil society. Obviously, uh, the private sector has a role to play here. Um, and to tell us where the private sector fits into this conversation, uh, I think we're going to head over now to Manila. Um, I'd like to bring in Yang Villa, who is head of the Philippines at Isle Utilities. Uh, Yang, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. Ladies and gentlemen, it's tempting to think that all of the private sector is a thriving place for creativity, where exciting innovations and new technologies are born. That may be what you see on popular media, but a vast majority of private sector organizations are places where ideas die. I should know. I come from a water utility background, and utilities are notoriously conservative. From 2009 to 2019, I worked in the utility investments business where my methods and principles have been called naive, often being told that I'm stepping out of line. I was being shoved into a box that I kept trying to outgrow. Now, this sentiment is a common experience among young people in the private sector. Many business leaders shoot down out of the box thinking, especially when it doesn't immediately serve the bottom line. Take, for instance, my push for understanding climate risks by using smart technology such as earth observation and geospatial analytics, as well as partnership with academia to support research. 
I thought for a water business that relies heavily on the availability of water, there was not nearly enough effort to understand how climate change can disrupt the business. In many private sector organizations, risk-taking and experimentation are allowed only under rigid conditions that at best only yield incremental results and at worst do nothing to change the failing status quo. And so today, I would like to offer three practical steps to build a culture of responsible risk-taking and, resp and productive experimentation that will empower your young employees to be more creative, bold, and innovative. First, on a fundamental level, I urge business leaders around the world to reevaluate their criteria for certainty and risks. I've never understood why, for example, we keep on using traditional engineering models and financial projections when clearly in the face of deep uncertainty brought about by the climate crisis, our assumptions about the future no longer hold. In the face of deep uncertainty, maintaining the same criteria for risks and rewards is not a sound business practice. This means that you should be prepared to try unproven methods, test new technologies, and allow for creative solutions. Pay attention to the new tools and ways of thinking that young people in your business are bringing to the table. When you relax your criteria for returns and encourage risk-taking, young people have more space to ideate and try new things. Second, encourage intrapreneurship and back it up with resources. Entrepreneurship, of course, is the practice of acting like an entrepreneur within an established company. There are many ways to do this, and you might want to try different methods like hackathons, innovation festivals. My favorite is the design sprint. See what works in terms of incentivizing young employees to own a challenge and design their own solutions. And please, don't just do it to generate ideas. As I said, again, most businesses are places where ideas die. Set aside resources, including mentorship or a bit of seed money, to turn these ideas into working prototypes that can be tested and progressively iterated. Be a champion to your company's young entrepreneurs. Lastly, and I do recognize that it takes a brave boss to permit this recommendation to happen, but please allow young employees to disregard boundaries. This is not just a rebel in me speaking. I think that the worst advice that you could possibly give a young person is that they shouldn't think or act beyond their job description. Narratives like, you're not being paid to do that, or that's not your problem, these can extinguish curiosity and expansive thinking. And once you kill curiosity, you can say goodbye to systemic thinking, that appreciation for the complex interconnectedness of things around us. The hardline boundaries set by bosses are the biggest hurdle to pursuing systems leadership which is the set of skills and capacities needed to catalyze, enable, and support systemic change. We need young people to want to become systems leaders if we are to have a chance at solving long-term and complex problems like the climate crisis, water insecurity, poverty, gender, and racial injustice. And mind you, the younger generation have a keen sense of how these problems are interconnected to begin with. Their curiosity will naturally lead them to explore and cross-fertilize their unique set of interests. And magic happens when young people learn how to put those interests together in the service of something bigger than themselves. Please do not extinguish young people's desire to make an impact by trapping them in routine and silos and traditional roles that only serve the failing status quo. Do not be the reason why young people shrink themselves to fit a certain mold. In closing, let me repeat my three recommendations. First, reevaluate your criteria for certainty and risks. Second, encourage entrepreneurship and back it up with resources. And third, allow young people to disregard boundaries. As I have taken on a, membership, uh, a mentorship role for the younger generation, my sincere desire has always been to never lose my capacity to be curious, to be bold and daring, to experiment, and to take risks. 
to our leaders in the private sector, I implore you to never forget how it is to be young. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yang. Um, and I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you for a really inspiring and, and very heartfelt and passionate contribution there. So uh, thank you for that. Um, we're now going to bring in a regional civil society perspective uh, and head over to the WaterAid West Africa office, where Abu Bakar Luge is going to share his experience of engaging national and regional decision makers on these issues. Now, Abu Bakar will be speaking in French, but his presentation slides are very detailed with text. All of that text is in English. Um, so if you aren't a French speaker, do please pay close attention to your screen. Uh, Abu Bakar, over to you. Okay, thank you, Joey. Uh, bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous. Uh, je m'en vais en fait vous présenter l'engagement de la jeunesse dans le domaine de l'eau et du changement climatique. Donc, je suis Abou Bakar Louguey, je suis le coordinateur de, de la Coordination nationale des jeunes pour l'environnement et le climat. Et c'est un plaisir pour moi de vous présenter en tout cas euh, ce thème-là. Next slide. Ok, et au Burkina Faso, d'où je viens, les jeunes comme euh, Clément Nana que vous voyez sont des jeunes agriculteurs qui contribuent moins au changement climatique, mais qui, qui subissent le plus en fait les effets du changement climatique. Et cela se traduit par quoi Ça, ça se traduit par euh, un, certain, un certain nombre de spots de sécheresse que nous avons vécu depuis par exemple moi ma naissance, et également par euh, une baisse en tout cas, et une mauvaise répartition des, des précipitations. Donc, je suis de la Coordination nationale des jeunes pour l'environnement et le climat, qui est une organisation qui réunit des jeunes eh, venant de, 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 un peu partout du Burkina Faso et également des organisations de jeunes qui militent pour la préservation de l'environnement. Next slide. OK. Au Burkina Faso, euh, les jeunes sont souvent moins impliqués dans le cadre de, de l'élaboration des politiques et programmes. Donc, il faut souvent, pour se faire entendre, pour euh, pouvoir contribuer, forcer un peu la main. Et nous, par exemple, euh, en 2021, nous avons, nous avons contribué euh, dans le cadre de la révision des de CDN au niveau du pays, à travers euh, une conférence consultative que nous avons organisée au niveau national, et qui a, avec le soutien des de Nations Unies, qui a permis à la jeunesse de comprendre comment ça se passe et également de formuler des fortes recommandations dans le cadre de, de, de ce processus de révision qui ont été soumis au gouvernement. Également, euh, dans le cadre des élections en 2020 au Burkina Faso, nous avons, avec le soutien de certains partenaires, mené une campagne voilà, à l'endroit des candidats à la présidence, euh, dénommée donc Empreinte Verte, qui a permis de, déjà d'analyser euh, les programmes des différents candidats et les formuler en fait... Euh, un certain nombre de recommandations à prendre en compte et des engagements à prendre en compte dans le cours du mandat. Et actuellement, nous sommes également dans, la, dans le suivi de, de ces programmes-là. Next slide. Donc, les jeunes sont aujourd'hui en fait conscients des défis que sont euh, les changements climatiques et les opportunités qu'ils les offrent. Donc, de plus en plus, ils rejoignent des mouvements, aussi bien au niveau local, national qu'international, qu et s'impliquent et passe également à l'action. Il y a plusieurs opportunités qui s'offrent, en tout cas pour mobiliser la jeunesse. D'une part, je prends le cas de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, d'où je suis. 64% de la population ont moins de 24 ans. Donc, c'est une grande opportunité pour mobiliser, parce qu'ils sont la majorité, pour mobiliser en tout cas ces jeunes-là dans le cadre de, de l'action climatique et également en faveur de l'eau. Également, les jeunes sont les promoteurs de nouvelles solutions. Et ces solutions sont très souvent également axées au climat, axées au. Les jeunes aujourd'hui également sont ceux qui vont en fait prendre la relève. Donc, il est temps et c'est mieux de les impliquer à partir de maintenant. Et également, le secteur du climat et de l'eau également sont source d'entrepreneurs vert et qui est également une opportunité en tout cas pour prendre en compte la jeunesse. 
dans cette lutte. Next slide, next slide, please. Donc, du coup, euh, il y a un certain nombre de défis qui s'offrent à nous. Donc, euh, l'un des défis, en fait, c'est que les jeunes sont de moins en moins, en tout cas, engagés dans le bénévolat. Et il y a également des difficultés de mobilisation des partenaires pour les initiatives des jeunes. Également, l'inaccessibilité, en tout cas, de, de, de certains fonds pour les jeunes et pour les organisations des jeunes. Donc, du coup, nous formulons des recommandations. Des recommandations pour le, pour le gouvernement. Il s'agit donc de faire de l'éducation au développement durable une priorité à effet d'échelle sur les résultats en, en matière d'adaptation et d'atténuation face au changement climatique. Et deuxièmement, c'est de prendre en compte la jeunesse et impliquer les jeunes dans toutes les politiques, programmes et actions de représentation en matière de changement climatique. Pour ce qui est des bailleurs, c'est de faciliter l'accès des organisations de jeunes au financement en matière de climat, également de faire de la prise en compte de la jeunesse et de leur implication, l'implication également des autres personnes vulnérables, une condition nécessaire d'accès en tout cas aux différents financements. Pour ce qui est des ONG et des OSC, nous recommandons en tout cas de faire confiance à l'expertise de la jeunesse dans le domaine de l'eau et du climat, parce que les jeunes aujourd'hui euh, ont assez d'expérience et veulent en fait se mettre à, à l'épreuve. Également, d'impliquer les organisations de jeunes dans la formulation des projets et programmes. Donc, je pense que euh, c'est le résumé de ce que j'avais comme euh, présentation à faire. Thank you. Thank you, Abu Bakar. Uh, merci bien. Et thank uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Abu Bakar, yeah, for, for sharing your perspective with us. Um, we've talked about civil society uh, in different contexts. Um, we've talked about policymakers. Uh, we've talked about the private sector. We haven't yet addressed the role of uh, research and academia in this discussion, um, but that's a very important one. So uh, I'd like now to bring in Emily Brook, who is a research assistant at the CIPRI Climate Change and Risk Programme, uh, joining us today from Sweden, I believe. Uh, Emily, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Joe. I'm so happy to be here with such a distinguished panel of speakers and to talk about a really important topic of youth empowerment. Uh, my name is Emily Brook, and as you mentioned, I'm currently working at CIPRI, the Stockholm Peace Research Institute. Uh, and prior to this, I was in IHE Delft, which is the Research Institute for Water Education in the Netherlands. Because of these experiences, I was invited today to impart ways that we can empower young people through the research and academic sectors. And to begin, uh, I think I will start with my own journey in youth empowerment, which began with Youth for the Rhine. Uh, two years ago, I co-created alongside Water Youth Network and other young leaders, the Youth for the Rhine. It's a project based in IHE Delft and funded by the Dutch Rijksvaterstaat. Youth for the Rhine uses a novel approach to empower young voices in research and policy making. It achieves this through the ABCD model of co-creation. Uh, Youth for the Rhine starts with the D, the demos, and in this case, young end users. It starts by asking these, these young people what they think is important in terms of climate adaptation, what we should focus on, and how we can solve this. By engaging all these voices, Youth for the Rhine empowers sustainable innovations. Youth for the Rhine actually just launched a survey on water quality, which I invite all young people in the basin to partake in. Uh, this, this survey engages young people to understand what their perspectives are, what their priorities are, and what we should focus on really when it comes to water quality issues in the river. Youth for the Rhine will also have a workshop in December where we will bring young people together around four concrete case studies to come up with solutions and practical recommendations. Together, this information will be trickled up to the higher decision-making levels to empower young people in higher decision-making. I continue today, next slide please, <laughs> to engage young people at CIPRI through my role in the Environment of Peace report. Uh, the EP report is a two-year research initiative which looks at how to secure peace in a context of environmental change. It provides practical policy advice on how to address these interconnections. 
As part of its research process, EP consulted in 2021 a group of 15 young people coming from different backgrounds and regions, with the only common denominator being that they were between the ages of 20 to 30 and, of course, had some interest in climate change and the environment. Uh, through a combination of workshops, surveys, interviews, roundtables, young people were, consult were consulted to understand how we best can secure and enable this environment of peace. Amongst the many messages, I think a few that stood out to me was the role of transparency in leadership processes and policy making, the importance of acknowledging privilege and asymmetrical power relations, and the dualism of developing versus developed. EP is an ongoing research process to engage young voices throughout the report. And instead of dedicating certain sections to this is what young people say or think, EP engages and streamlines them throughout the whole report. Um, and I think this is a good way to really show that young voices are everywhere, not just in certain specific sections. Next slide, please. So as a young researcher myself in climate change, um, when it comes to youth engagement, there are three things that come to mind. First, I think that there is kind of a research gap, actually, when it comes to seeing how climate change, security risks, conflict risks affect young people specifically. And on the other hand, how can young people address these risks? What tools or advantages do young people bring uh, that should be further highlighted? So this is a research gap I think we actually should further pursue. The second one, and I think it was mentioned before me, the solving the climate crisis is a shared effort. It is not only up to young people to do this. Um, and I think this is important to realize because it is a shared burden that we all need to do together and not only up to young people. And finally, this was also highlighted by the young people in the EP report. Young activists, young researchers, and scientists should exchange more views and learn from one another. I think both sides can benefit from closer engagement. Next slide, please. So to conclude, I have three practical recommendations we can take to further engage young people in research. The first is that we need to highlight the problem solving capacities and advantages of incorporating young voices in research. I think as Joe mentioned previously, it should not be a box ticking exercise, but more something that we recognize is really important to solving climate issues. Youth empowerment is for all of us and not only for the benefit of young people. Second, technology. That should be used to promote more inclusive opportunities and reduce entry barriers for young people. I think especially during Corona, it showed that we can do research from wherever we are. But also technology can help highlight the unique roles and advantages young people can play because young people, of course, have capacity and advantages when it comes to being able to use digital means. So technology can really empower young people in research. And finally, we need to establish mentorship programs between senior and early career researchers. It is important that senior researchers use their positions of power to enable young people to step in and have the space to thrive. In the research sector, this can be as simple as allowing young people to be the first author on reports or being able to present their findings to high level decision makers. Young people should work together with senior people to develop themselves, perhaps through PhDs, through trainings, to be able to reach their full potentials. Thank you very much. And I hope that this presentation gave us all some things to think about uh, moving forward. And I really look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thanks so much. Emily, Emily, this is Hank. I have one question. Sorry, Joe. Go ahead, Hank. Yeah, you said very easily, just you know, almost in between lines, I started the Youth for the Rhine project, but how? Because uh, what, what, what we've been lis listening to is that there is an institutional world and then a non-institutional world that, you know, when it comes to resources, there's a huge gap. And you, you started this program out of nothing from scratch. How did, how did this happen? How were you able to make, because I think that is what we want to learn is that when you do it, then okay, A, B, C, D, eh, eh, it starts to work and you start with D, the demos. But that first step, how did that work? Yes, thank you, Hank, for this great question. I think how it worked was that there was an idea that was come up with, and but what was missing is the young energy. 
Um, so me, alongside my colleague Tim from Water Youth Network and other great water leaders, were able to bring energy. What was missing was this young energy, this, as I mentioned, the capacity to be able to use digital tools and networking to empower and create this, solution, this idea and bring it to life. Um, so shortly, that's how I would reply. Young energy was missing, and we brought it to create this idea. Thank you. Thanks, Emily, and thanks, Hank, for that intervention as well. I think that's a very important question, um, highlighting the role of institutions in all of this. Um, yeah, thank you, Emily, for making your recommendations uh, so practical and, and keeping things tangible as well. Um, that's what makes this uh, this session worthwhile, I think. Um, so we do have one more speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Neil Dot. Neil is Executive Director of Aquafed, uh, but he wears many hats, um, and I think he's joining us today in his capacity as coordinator of the UN Water Listening Exercise uh, that took place in the run-up to World Water Day earlier this year, um, and which enjoyed a really substantial response from young people around the world. Uh, Neil's going to tell us a bit about that now. So, Neil, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Um, let me just get my stopwatch. I'm going to be exactly five minutes. So, yeah, I'm not representing Aquafed. I'm representing, I guess, UN Water because I was we were a UN Water partner. But most importantly, I'm representing the thousands of brilliant young people that I got to engage with during this uh, listening exercise we did this year through the World Water Day campaign. And it was actually, I wasn't expecting them to participate so much. And, and I think that was almost a life-changing moment for the campaign and certainly for me. So I'll tell you briefly what we learned from them. So I'm talking to you today, I'm giving you a message from the ground up from young people, both young water professionals, but just young people generally who care about their environment, who care about what's happening because of climate change, and, and who care about water very much as well. And I'm really pleased that Mr. Ovink is here today. And a lot of this is directed to him, I think, and the Tajik government as we head to the 2023 conference, because I think young people have, have given us a, a, a path forward now, and they are basically saying, engage us now, and they want to be part of the, in, to the, the kind of the roadmap and the, the run up to 2023. They want to be a part of it. And, and I think now we can discuss how to do it. So Kato, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, what was em empowering and what would, was the listening exercise? It was essentially uh, the, 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 a new element to the annual water, World Water Day campaign. The theme was valuing water this year. And what we wanted to do as UN Water is um, ask people around the world what they thought, what, 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 the, you know, what water meant to them, what was the value of it? Was it cultural? Is it economic? Is it social? Um, is it religious? I mean, all sorts of things. And we, it was a basic thing about using social media to to talk to people and actually try to have a conversation with them again you know between the un down on the ground and, and just think about that for a moment how does that uh, how often does that actually happen when we connect uh those who work in geneva and new york down to somewhere like uh in in, in literally in a village in tanzania and this is what this campaign was about and, and trying to ensure that two-way communication so and um, we we're quite pleased about the way it turned out kato next slide please um yeah i mean really this was i said this was the first time we took this action but the young people and, and young professionals really really made this campaign why it's relevant to cop actually because the conversations we had were um, a lot about the impacts of climate change. It was interesting that probably none, no one, you know, under the age of 25 actually mentioned the word climate change, but they talked about the impacts that they were experiencing, which we know are due to climate change. And I think that's something quite important in terms of the language we use when we communicate with young people. Young people see impacts, young people see experiences on the ground, and that's what they're trying to tell us. They don't see things like mitigation or adaptation. They don't really care about that. And they, they you know, they just want to know about, they want to tell us what they're seeing and what we're gonna do about it. Kato, next slide, please. These are the five basic messages that we heard from people. And again, these are uh, all relatable to um, what we're talking about at COP this week, but absolutely relatable to uh, the 2023 conference. They, the strongest message I thought was the first one was protecting water is everyone's responsibility. And they, they were saying that there's a collective effort needed to um, protect our water sources um, or, you know, on the surface and under the ground. But the other things, water is life, Water is a human right, and 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 young people particularly made this connection between water, the environment, and and food, 
And they were saying that there'll be no food without water, which is, again, I think a very important message and a very important part of the discussions of what we're hearing at COP this week. Kato, next slide, please. Okay, here's the important part, folks, in about a minute left. Here's what they told us, okay? Action, the first one. Young people told us and told me very clearly that they want to actually do things. If we're going to run any campaigns and if we're going to empower young people and engage with young people, not just talking at them, get them involved and get them part of doing something, even if it's very, very small, a small action, a small step. They want to feel and touch that they've done something. It's very important. And I think a lot of our campaigns that I see in the water sector are just bland statements that go out on social media and we want you to retweet something. And that's and young people are saying that's just the first step. Next step, trust and independence. Young people are saying to us and have given me examples of all of these actually that we have, but we don't have time for. They've said, trust us to be part of service development and implementation. And trust, they say that the best way to do it, particularly if we're looking at the global south, is use civil society organizations on the ground to kind of administer whatever funding's available. They see that civil society groups are the strongest mechanism of taking funds from donors or national or regional government onto the ground. And I think that's a very important step. It's not a new message, but it's what young people have told us. Peer to peer. So this is one of the strongest things we picked out in the campaign for the examples we heard of young people learning from each other and let them do that to each other. So we've got in the next session after this, we'll be hearing example of the water solutionaries. Now that's a brilliant example of peer to peer learning on an international level where young people are in, in Africa, I can't remember which country, are talking to young people in America about the experience of living around lakes and trying to, to protect it and improve it, which is really great. Uh, formal platforms, and I think this comes across from what Yang was saying, but there's many others. Uh, I think everyone has said this as well, that uh, we need to just not just pretend we're listening, but actually set things con in motion, in concrete, for young people to bring their ideas. And I think the final message really is let young people co-design and and success factors in, in any type of project. And that goes right from what from the, the world I'm in, in PPPs. You know, we're, young people should be involved from right at the beginning about explaining what a public-private partnership service agreement is going to do and what benefits it should bring and ask young people to be involved in that as well. That, that just doesn't happen enough. Um, so I think those are the, that's the run-through. I've gone over time, but uh, again, I'm going to go back to my initial message is that in the run-up now to the, this very, very important 2023 conference, we should be building on what we've built really on the on the listening exercise we have a huge community of young people around the world willing to take this this these next steps with us and we've got all these steps like the world water forum we've got a dushan bay conference we should be involving young people now along the way getting them to be part of this movement about highlighting the case for water and sanitation and protecting our resources and getting them to do things along the way as well i think that's really really important sorry i was so fast the lack of time but joe back to you Great. Right. Thank you so much, Neil. And again, as with other speakers, thanks for making this concrete. Thanks for making it concise uh, and, and really actionable. Um, now, we need to cut off in seven minutes sharp. Um, so we've just got time. Neil, for a can, I, can I ask you one question, question, Neil? Yeah, Hank, go ahead. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you really call on us, and I, I agree. Eh? Uh, UN 2023 Water Conference, eh? the second United Nations Conference on Water in the history of the United Nations, the first since 1977. Uh, you, in your role at UN Water, you really have to help us. Because eh? uh, the world is big uh, and there's just as much as we can organize. So what are the ways forward? How can we ensure that that voice of youth is not only heard, but part of this now in setting the agenda? Uh, as we said with 2023, from our perspective, is that the lead up to this conference, should over already be transaction transformative. Eh? Eh? It should be inclusive. It should be about making sure that all those voices are there and that we have an agenda and commitments towards 2023. So we don't have a talk shop in 2023. No three days of global leaders just blah, 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 blah. But uh, 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 three days of working together, um, uh, uh, making sure that those commitments are on the table and then the, the process afterwards is about implementation and action. Uh, but here I am at COP. Eh? Uh, we have a small crowd of uh, young water uh, leaders. 
uh, this is not enough. Eh? So uh, UN Water and all the other institutions should be able to help us drive this forward. So how, how can we do this? Two quick answers to your question, Henk. First one is be very uh, brave and actually have a conversation with young people. Because uh, in, in the listening exercise, I have afraid to say this, not about me, but I felt like I was the only one actually having a two-way conversation with people. And I really wanted more UN Water partners to be involved and just, just talk to them. I mean, Hank, I'm from the private sector. You'd think that I'd be a bit scared because I've got no PR people to hide behind. And um, but I, I, and I was expecting perhaps some criticism about the private sector. Didn't happen at all. It wasn't about that because everyone, we were all on message and we were all trying to talk about the same issue. So number one, be brave. Secondly, I think you talk about the commitments. Let's uh, properly have a two-way conversation about something specific with young people, which is the kind of commitments they want to see at um, being made at 2023. And that starts now, not at 2023, with just a few young people that we've managed to pick up. We need to start now and build the momentum up all the way to 23, if that makes sense. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Neil. And thanks, Hank, for your intervention there. Um, we do have time for one more extremely quick answer um, to a quick question that I'd like to pose now to Yang, just on that subject of the private sector. Um, we've heard a lot this week throughout COP about the role of the private sector in driving change um, or impeding change, um, depending on your uh, perspective and depending on your organizational experience. Yang, in one, two minutes, um, could you just give us an answer? What would you say to those who argue that the role of the private sector is actually part of the problem and not the solution in this context. Uh, to which I would say to them, I completely agree. We cannot deny that industry and business has been a key reason for the climate crisis. But you know, everyone is to blame in some measure or other. However, I think that it would be a mistake to exclude the private sector from the solution moving forward. Business and industry have been such a major driving force in shaping the world to what it is today and what it will be in the future. And I believe that in order to reconfigure business and reshape industry, the youth are critical. So by all means, keep applying pressure on businesses to change course, but to sustain the effort that we're doing today, we need young people to step up to be become, again, what I call systems leaders, because they are tomorrow's captains of industry. And the advantage of systems leaders is that they appreciate complex problems from different angles. This leads to a shared vision and more cooperation, less friction for collaboration. And if we allow young people in the private sector to own these complex challenges and empower them to act, they will design better, more human-centric, more planet-centric solutions. So don't leave the private sector out of the equation. Great. Thank you, Yang. Thanks for keeping it short and concise. Uh, Kato, can we re-establish the slides here? Yep, so very briefly, two minutes left before we wrap up. Um, if you think back to the beginning of the session, we highlighted the findings of the scoping study that we carried out into the problems facing young people in the water and climate space. Um, VWI is looking for partners to help us develop and implement a new multi-stakeholder work plan that actually tries to address some of those challenges. Um, there'll be a group of core organizations um, who will take ownership of specific work streams. We also want to create a wider group, sort of uh, community of practice or advisory group of interested parties who are committed to learning from the action plan and to strengthening their own youth engagement activities. Um, so we'd like to invite you to join us here. There's a QR code on screen. Uh, scan that with your phone, um, whether you're there in person in Glasgow or whether you're following this online. Um, that'll take you to a Google form uh, where you can just express your interest. Uh, we will then follow up with you to provide more information and we can keep that conversation going. Um, you can express interest in joining that core group or you can express an interest just in being part of the sort of looser community of practice, the advisory group. Um, whichever you prefer, let us know. Fill out the form uh, and we will get back to you. Uh, next slide then, please, Cutter. And that's it from us. Um, Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, as has already been mentioned, um, this is not the only youth session that's happening at COP today. Uh, so stay tuned to the live stream or stick around at the booth uh, if you're in Glasgow uh, for more examples of how young people can be part of the solution to the water and climate challenges that we all face. Um, don't forget, you've still got a few seconds to, to sign up for that QR code. 
fill out the form uh, and, and let us know if you're interested in taking this conversation further. Uh, that's it from us, and I wish you the very best for the rest of COP26. Thank you.